and uh, malfunctioning baby. Mm -hmm. You're cute, but I need you to be quiet. <gasps> Welcome to Journey with a Destination. I'm Taylor, this is Sid, and we've been working on a new approach to literature education called Journey into Literature. Uh, we've recently released the first entry called Journey into Shadows and Shining Armor. It's available as a free download on our website or for purchase as a hardcover, and in this video we're going to tell you all about it. Our Journey into Literature series takes a very different approach to literature education than most curricula. One of the key concepts is that we really want to help students enjoy reading. And that's something that you see not only in the selections that we include in our curriculum, but also even in the way that we, we format and, and distribute these works. We've divided it into three different volumes, which are each reasonably sized so that you can get into bed and you can read this for an hour before you go to sleep without any trouble. This isn't like a giant textbook where it's unwieldy, it's uncomfortable to read, it's small font. No, this is meant to be easy to read, pleasant to read, it's just meant to be a good experience. Um, the works that we've included are not necessarily the same works that you would expect in many other literature curriculum. Yes, we've included uh, many of the long recognized classics. There are uh, works by or else uh, adapted from writers like uh, Shakespeare, and we've got uh, works of Tennyson and Oscar Wilde and, and others here. But uh, in addition, we include works that are more relevant to understanding pop culture. So we've got some of the first stories that started to uh, introduce the concepts of superheroes and supervillains and uh, things that have been influential in establishing the course of literature over the past century. And one of the things that we're doing is every year of our curriculum, we're focusing on uh, just a small number of genres of literature. This is very, very different from the way that most literature curricula approach things. Um, typically, one year of literature might study American literature or English literature or world literature. We don't think that's actually a very effective way of thinking about different literary works. Um, because at the end of the day, genre transcends these sorts of national boundaries or uh, temporal boundaries. So we think it's much better, instead of focusing on um, just nationalities of literature, we, we think it's actually much more effective to look at individual genres and try to understand those genres at a deep level. Because when you walk into a bookstore or, or you decide you want to try and read some more, you're not going to be thinking, I want to read more English literature. You're going to be thinking, uh, I like science fiction literature, so I'm going to go look up the best science fiction literature, or I like romance, or I like horror, or what have you. And so seventh grade, which we're going to be talking about here, is uh, primarily based around medieval legends and works inspired by medieval legends as well as detective stories, and it really delves deep into the sorts of themes and narratives that uh, are associated with those two uh, sub-regions of literature. So it took about a year and a half to get all, all of the materials found, and also we added so many footnotes. So many footnotes! We promise that there is not more than, I believe, five on a page. I think that was the limit I was given. There's a few exceptions, but on average, it's it's definitely lower than that. Yeah, because we do understand that too many footnotes, it means A, it's too hard for that grade level, and B, I think that overwhelms anyone. Uh, but yes, there are footnotes that will cover things that are cultural, historical, that they may not just know on the top of their heads. 
and also vocabulary words. Um, and yes, the, and we've also got write-ups at the beginning of each each um, work that kind of gives an introduction and any sort of historical background you need to know before you start reading. It also goes through um, other literary terms such as like satire. I believe we've got one on the hero's journey. It just describes and goes through all the things you can expect in literature. And another thing that we don't do that makes us quite a bit different than others is we don't believe in giving kids questions about what they're reading. Let them just enjoy it. Because I also do find, I remember this. I remember this so distinctly as a kid. We would, um, I remember this in 10th grade. Our teacher was particularly bad about this. We would go home and read. And we would actually read. I mean, we, I, I remember me and my friends would actually read these books. And then every, you know, day we would come, home, come to school and she would test us on what we read. And she would ask us stuff that we just didn't even think to, to, to notice, like how many rings was on a guy's finger. Yeah, it's, it's always trivia stuff. When, when you look at what these uh, textbooks actually ask you about, it's fairly rare for the questions to really be that thought-provoking. And we do have some semi-rhetorical questions that sometimes show up after uh, kids have read a, a work. Sometimes we'll just ask them to think about certain things. But there's nothing like essay questions or pop quizzes or anything like that because we don't want to break up the flow of reading. And I think that's something that so many educators get wrong because you look at the way that a, a public school works. They have to constantly be getting feedback about how a large class of students is doing. And the only way to do that effectively is to ask them to write essays, ask them to do quizzes. Our philosophy here is you're the parent and you know your children and you sit down to dinner with your children and you know whether they're reading these books and you can talk to them and ask them, so what was it that you read about? What did you get out of it? And you can understand your child's performance so much better than a school teacher can understand the performance of all 20 to 30 kids simply by having those conversations with them. And the benefit is then your child doesn't have any obstruction to reading an awful lot of literature. I mean, really, the, the, we're not skimping on the amount of literature we want kids to, to experience. Um, and, and the only way to really do that effectively is to let kids just sit down and, and read and immerse themselves in the world of literature. A good rule of thumb to know whether or not your child is reading or not is every child always whines about something, right? If they're not whining about it or they're not telling you how great it is, there's a good chance they're not reading it. I mean, let's just be real. What is really nice about these is that they are illustrated. Um, I think what happens a lot is once you hit middle school, they just rip all of the nice, lovely illustrations away. And we have kept a lot of illustrations in these. Um, they are black and white, but they're beautiful. And they were in the originals, the original like prints too. So you're seeing how the books were originally meant to be read. And we've done a lot of work to... Uh, we, you've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of work to uh, revitalize some of these images. Uh, it's very difficult to find them in a, a good, clean, sharp form. And we've I done one. a lot of work to de-age them. Yeah, I mean, I... The one we've got for Don Quixote is one of my favorites. Seriously, the, 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 the pictures we've got for Don Quixote are just so much fun. And, and, and this stuff matters uh, because it matters that there's a good reading experience. If kids enjoy reading, they will read more. So here's volume one of Shadows in, in Shining Armor. And the first, the first bit, which... So let me say this. Let me, let me, let me say this. If there is something that your child really hates, don't don't hesitate to maybe let them skip something. But if you're gonna force enforce anything, it's gonna have to be when Knights Revolt. Um, it is a nonfiction selection, and it it gives historical cultural um, background to knights. And if you don't get that, half of our knight selection will not make sense at all. 
Um, so that one is, that one's super, super important. Then you've got the Song of Roland, which I think I'm going to just say all of these are super important constantly. Yeah. And this is, this is not the complete poem. This is a simplified prose version of uh, a work that is extremely foundational within French literature. Um, and then you've got Ogier the Dane, which that one's, that one's really it, amazing. It, it's, yeah, it's, it, so, so both of these, the Song of Roland and Ogier the Dane, they're based on uh, Charlemagne and his 12 peers, which is uh, somewhat analogous to the, uh, the, the, the English concept of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. And it's something that a lot of people have never heard of, have no idea about, don't know who Charlemagne is. And so one of the benefits of being able to focus on specific genres or themes of literature is that we get a chance to, to actually make sure kids know about this important body of, of literature known as the Matter of France and to understand a little bit its connection to some of the stories they probably have heard of, like King Arthur. Uh, then you've got t the tale of uh, the Cid, which was a, he was a real guy in the Reconquista. Um, what's interesting and so important about this one is you really get to see how fiction and nonfiction just twirl into these kind of crazy tales. Then we've got The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by the Agatha Christie. I think she is, in my opinion, if you're going to have your child read anyone, it has to be Agatha Christie. Because if you like her, you are opening up a whole world of literature. And also, she's got her own little canon. Um, the Murder of Roger Ackroyd is so much fun because it twists so many of the kind of tropes of mystery. I mean, she just kind of goes crazy. It is so good. Then we've got The Gateway to Spencer. So The Gateway to Spencer is something that we're really proud of here. Uh, good luck finding this anywhere except in Journey into Shadows and Shining Armor. But it it is a children's introduction to the epic poetry of a man known as Edmund Spencer, who was a contemporary of William Shakespeare. He wrote wonderful, beautiful poetry that is today quite difficult to read and would normally be well above the level of a seventh grader. This is the sort of thing that you would really expect to be reading in, in college. So you've got things like, so pure and innocent as that same lamb, she was in life and every virtuous lore, and by descent from royal lineage came of ancient kings and queens that had of yore their scepters stretched from east to western shore, and all the world in their subjection held, till that infernal fiend with foul uproar for wasted all their land, and them expelled whom to avenge she had this night from far compelled. Um, it, it's just beautiful stuff, but normally you would never expect to be able to hand that to a seventh grader and uh, have them understand everything that's going on. But what the Gateway to Spencer does is it provides a simple, accessible introduction to the, the big stories in Edmund Spencer's poetry. And this is just written in prose, in simple language that any seventh grader can understand. And then after they've read about each of these stories, then they'll get an excerpt of Spencer's poetry. And the, the nice thing then is they don't need to actually learn about what happened as they're reading the poetry or try to figure out what's going on because they already know that. They've already read about the story and now they're just reading a little bit of the poetic form of it. And that also, just like all the rest of the selections within this book, is um, heavily footnoted. And so children have, when they're reading this, every benefit, every uh, advantage that they could possibly have to be able to understand as much of it as, as most anyone today can. But it's also low pressure because, again, they already know the story. So if all they get out of reading the poetry is a vague sense of the, the flow and the feel of what epic poetry sounds like, then that's good enough. So it's, I, I think this is such an important thing for kids 
to be exposed to things that are challenging in ways that they can still handle it. Uh, there's such a sense of accomplishment that comes from that. And I think kids like tackling tough stuff. It gives them such a greater sense of what they can actually do. Then we've got the short story, which is The Little Hunchback, which is a Thousand and One Night story. It's it's a kid's translation. Again, it's, it's pretty simple and easy. Um, it's also rather interesting because it takes the form of what is kind of an inverse detective story, and so that gives us an opportunity to talk about another concept that's important within detective fiction and introduce them to a little bit of another subgenre. Um, then we've got The Adventure of the Copper Beaches, which is uh, Sherlock. I, I don't think he needs any introduction there, does he? Uh, and then we've got The Art of War, which I don't think a lot of people know this. The Art of War is tiny. So before you're like, what? Yeah, I mean, it's, let's see here. In our version right here, it is maybe 50 pages. I don't think it's even quite there yet. Um, and the reason the art of war was chosen is because it's more about using your intelligence to outwit your enemy, which fit the, fit the genre pretty well. And also, we are trying very hard to mix in as much of the world literature as we can into these. And then we've got volume number two. Um, so we've got An Ideal Husband by Oscar Wilde, which is a play. I think it's the first play we add. Um, and Oscar Wilde, he's a pretty easy read. So if you're going to have a first play, Oscar Wilde is perfect. Um, the reason An Ideal Husband was, it was chosen because it has a lot of political intrigue in it, but it's also... It's fun. It's easy. It, it's, it's got probably one of the more realistic romance lines I think I've seen in a while. And one of the main characters is a knight in an era when knighthood means something very different, of course. But ultimately, it's really about the idea of how he reconciles uh, current events and current necessities with his responsibilities as an upstanding citizen and as a knight. We've got Warriors of Old Japan. Now, what is really interesting about Warriors of Old Japan is that the woman who wrote this, um, her father, so her, her mother is English and her father was Japanese, and her father was like the first, one of the first um, Japanese um, men to be sent over to England to be educated there. And so she is, she is very interesting because she is British and Japanese. I mean, she has, she, uh, we include her biography, and she is very much knows both cultures very, very well. So when she retold these stories, she made it in a way that Western audiences could easily jump in and, and she explained some of the concepts that I think some other translations might not because they kind of assume you know. Um, yeah, The Warriors of Old Japan is, is about samurais and some of the ancient legends that are told in Japan today. Um, some of the big ones are, let's see here, um, you've got... The Princess of the Bull, that one is a fun one. Uh, it's, it, it's kind of a Cinderella story, but very, very peculiar. It's fun. Uh, we've got the story of Lazy Taro. Um, oh boy, the, the story of Yoshi Tsune, um, the story of Benkei. Some of these are very famous, some of these aren't, but anyways, they're fun. Um, then we have The Adventures of Don Quixote. Now, this is a, a um, abridged and a child's version written by William Makepeace Thackeray, who wrote Vanity Fair. So, fun fact, he wrote a kid's version. And let me just say, this one is illustrated, and it's a very fun illustration. I mean, they're just beautiful. Then we've got Arsene Lupin, who... I feel like the West doesn't know him very well, but he is actually a, he was a super influential um, character. Um, he's, he's very much um, your, your super thief who outwits the police all the time. He, he's a gentleman thief with a heart of gold who has a bit of a redemption arc, kind of a bit of a Robin Hood figure sometimes. Um, and what we've added are some of the earlier stories that introduce him. And it's, it's just a really fun take on the detective slash mystery genre because you're seeing it from a very different perspective here. And now he's in an anime, or his great-grandson. Is it, it's his grandson, isn't it? Lupin the Third. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. But you be careful with that one. The older stuff is meant for adults. It gets more childish as it goes on, right? I, I think the the manga is. Uh, uh, yeah, not, yeah, not yeah. yeah I didn't think the manga. Yeah, yeah. So then we've got child's versions of Henry the Fourth and Henry the Fifth. Um. So so th three plays by William Shakespeare: Henry the Fourth Part One, Henry the Fourth Part Two, and Henry the Fifth. And these are simplified prose introductions to those plays. In seventh grade, we don't have children reading any of Shakespeare's actual plays in their original form. That would be asking a little too much. In the next grade level, when we release eighth grade, which will focus on horror and romance, uh, then we will be introducing some of Shakespeare's original plays there. Uh, then we've got more Sh uh, Sherlock with the Musgrave w Ritual, which is, I believe, um, Arthur Conan Doyle, that's one of his favorites. Mm -hmm. So we've got The Reluctant Dragon by Kenneth Graham. He's the same guy who did The Wind in the Willows. And The Reluctant Dragon is a short story. It's basically a parody of The Knight's Tale. It's, it's, it's hilarious. It's cute. It's sweet. And yes, there is a Disney movie based off of it, loosely. Very loosely, from what I understand. The Great Mining Swindle and Sexton Blake's Christmas Truce. Most people today probably have no idea who Sexton Blake is supposed to be, uh, but he was a wildly popular character in literature, mostly for young boys, and basically he's one of the forerunners to uh, the superhero genre. A lot of the tropes that you see uh, with superheroes where they, uh, they, they have sophisticated gadgets and they go wander the world and fight over the, the top uh, villains who have uh, maybe magical powers or really sophisticated technology. Uh, a lot of that was introduced in Sexton Blake and similar types of young adult uh, literature at the time. And so this is just, it, it's a big chunk of the development of popular culture that's largely been forgotten. And being able to uh, showcase that to, to kids and to, to help them understand that here's how detective fiction essentially became superhero fiction. I think that's just a really great way of connecting what children are reading here with other things that they might already be interested in. And then we've got numero three, which, haha, -ha, we start off with the Redheaded League, which I think is my favorite Sherlock story. It's, it's just, it's a must read. You just, you just have to read it. It's very quirky. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious. Um, then we've got The Queen of Dionysius by Ernest Brahma, which is something we can't really say much about without spoilers because truly everything about this story is a spoiler but let's just say it is a very memorable introduction to a story detective the next is the book of king arthur by howard Pyle. it was very popular at its time it's still pretty important it tells the basic stories of king arthur and his court um we used the winning of the kinghood part one part two and part three the winning of the sword and the winning of a queen then we've got the hound of the baskervilles which is one of uh, arthur conan doyle's best loved uh sherlock holmes books it really straddles the line between detective stories and gothic horror and uh, it's it's just really lovely because the environment itself is a character within the book and that as also gives us lots of opportunities to talk about uh, environments as a storytelling element. Once again, good luck finding a better version of The Hound of the Baskervilles, because what we found is most printings of The Hound of the Baskervilles right now uh, don't include the really beautiful illustrations, uh, or else they only include a small fraction of them, because it turns out that it's actually rather hard to track down a lot of the illustrations that, that the story was originally published with when it was serialized. Uh, and we've included them all. We've worked to undo blemishes and sharpen the images. And so truly, this is the best version of The Hound of the Baskervilles you're going to get. 
So next up, we've got two short stories by Robert Barr. Uh, the first is a parody of Sherlock Holmes called The Great Pegram Mystery. And then the second is a sort of darkly comedic thriller called The Hour and the Man. And then finally, we cap it all off with The Gateway to Tennyson. And this is much like The Gateway to Spencer in that it takes a poet who wrote long, sophisticated poetry, specifically Alfred Tennyson, and it provides uh, prose introductions to uh, a lot of the stories that he told while also intermixing uh, excerpts from his poetry. And uh, it includes a number of his different works, but most especially it draws from his work, The Idols of the King, which is about King Arthur. And so once again, children will be able to experience a different perspective of the Arthurian legends, and they'll be able to really benefit from seeing this, this wonderfully sophisticated poetry by one of the true masters of, of the art. One of the things that uh, I found when reading poetry for literature studies is the sorts of poems that generally get included tend to be really short and they tend to mostly just be talking about basic emotions. There's very seldom any sort of story in them, but uh, the poetry of Tennyson and the epic poetry of Spencer are very different in that they're using poetry to tell complete stories, complete heroic tales, and Really, reading this sort of poetry feels much more like reading a book, but one that is written within the context of a very structured form. And that's the sort of thing that I think boys especially can appreciate much more than the, the sorts of, of, of very brief poetry excerpts that typically show up in most curricula. And what's just lovely about this is once you get to the very end, the very last story that uh, kids will, uh, will read in our curriculum is The Death of Arthur, and then that just closes out the book. And, and I think that's just such a lovely and poignant way to cap off an intense, but I think also extremely productive literature year. As we said, uh, this is just one year that we've released. We're working on others. Uh, and in particular, you can expect to see a pre-release of 8th grade very soon, and that's going to focus on the genres of horror and romance. It won't have any footnotes, and it won't have hard copy, but you'll get the free downloadable, basically, compilement of all of the short stories and all of the poems and all of the novels and a lot of excerpts because Gothic novels are chunksters, so there's a lot of that kind of thing. The, the final release will, but the, the, we'll, we'll, we'll initially give you a downloadable pre-release that, that won't include all of the bells and whistles that, that are available here and that will be available in 8th in grade when we fully release it. You can download all three volumes here by going to our website, journeywithadestination.com, or by following the link in the description below. There's no sign up or anything like that. You just go to the website, you download the PDF, and you can view them, print them at your leisure, whatever you'd like to do there. And you can also purchase uh, hard copies as well. You can do that from a number of different online uh, retailers, and you can find links for that also at our website. Oh, and we also have it on Kindle. Yes. Yes, I, I'm going to do a little plug-in for Kindle because, mainly because you can write notes, you can highlight. Um, also, fun fact, it tells you your reading speed. So if you really are suspicious your kids ain't reading, you can look at their reading speed and you can kind of tell. I mean, like, if they're just flipping through the thing real quick, it'll let you know pretty quickly, so. Yeah, and the Kindle price is very cheap. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more of this, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe and tune into our YouTube channel and our website for future literature releases and other educational materials. And I'll try it one more time. No, the sneeze will be perfect. The sneeze will be perfect. It's a perfect little bite.